So I, maybe I'll begin by talking about the kinds of things that we document and the end products of a documentation and what that looks like and what's useful. The thing is that there's not a single answer because what you want to create depends a lot on what's already there for the language and what you already know about and the quality of the existing materials. But minimally, people, I think, would agree that you need to have some kind of lexicon or dictionary, some sort of grammar to explain a reference grammar in a, an accessible kind of format that has is multi-purpose, really, so that people who are learning the language can understand what's going on, people can use the grammar if they want to produce pedagogical materials to teach the, teach the language, but also for people who want to study the language. Sometimes that won't all fit in a single grammar. There's just too many different audiences there. But that's the ideal. If you have the grammar and the lexicon, then the other thing that you need is a set of texts. And that's a very broad category of texts. We're very good at collecting folklore, and those tend to be the first texts that people get. One of the things that's changed in documentation, I think, that how it differs from old-fashioned field work is that we really like to have both audio and video with that collection of texts, and, and linguists and communities alike treasure that because that's how you see that the language is actually used. But what kinds of texts you collect really depends a lot on what's already been collected. If there's absolutely nothing, then you want to go for everything that you can. And traditional folklore is a good place to start because those texts tend to be easy to collect if people have good knowledge of the language. But that is, shouldn't really be the, the end point or the stopping point. That's not enough. I always advocate getting a broad range of texts, a whole different kinds of genres and registers, language as used in different domains, for a whole lot of reasons. One is that people don't speak as they do in folklore, and people are really interested in different kinds of language, languages that's used in different situations. Life stories are great to get. People tend to have lots of life stories to tell. And one of the things about getting a different, different kinds of genres in texts is that you can get different vocabulary and you can get different grammatical structures since different, different types of language use, use different grammar. Recipes are good to get. People like to talk about food. People like to prepare food and people like to eat. And so that's a really good way of getting pieces of, uh, or windows to understanding of the culture. You can get a lot of cultural knowledge and information is embedded in different texts. It's really great if you can get, if you still have speakers, if you can get recordings of people conversing. People do want to know how to converse and the best way is not to just have a written transcript of a text but to see people actually doing it because all kinds of things pull into conversation that aren't captured in written language not just intonation but facial gestures hand gestures expressions body language how people take diff take turns in conversation all those things are very very important to get people talking to different people people of different age ranges different genders so when we talk about a text collection, I think that the word text itself is even somewhat a bit of a misnomer because that suggests a written document. But really what linguists talk about there is they want examples of language as used in real life. Recipes, speeches, any kind of instructional text, how to build something, uh, uh, Oral histories are great. Instructions to children, do this, don't do that. Uh, sometimes those are very simple commands, you know, don't, don't eat with dirty hands or don't hit your sister or those kinds of things, but sometimes they're longer and they, they again, the ideal kind of text, I think, should, has lots of different information in it. So those kinds of texts will have imperative forms telling you what to do, what not to do, but also cultural taboos are often in there. Sometimes we just don't know if we come from a different culture, things that are acceptable to do and not acceptable to do. Speeches, uh, just a whole range of things. How you talk about the weather, what you talk about, 
how you talk about whatever the community does, farming practices, herding practices, building boats, weaving, any of those things. And sometimes it's just the, the conversation of every day, what people talk about, things that might seem boring on the outside, but are boring in the moment that you're actually thinking about them. But those are, those are the pizza, pieces that make up our lives, and, and people are very interested in that. And again, as you, if you sort of follow people throughout their day and see what they do, then you can get a wide range of vocabulary and just language and use. How do you wash up at night? You know, what do you do when you get up in the morning? What do you say to people? Some, some places you say, did you sleep well? And some you just say, good morning. Do you want your coffee? What, the, all, those, the, all those kinds of uh, things that are sometimes ritualized, people care very much about learning those rituals. And when, when we say ritual, you tend to think of something highly religious and formulaic. And that's really important to record, too, if it's possible. Some of these things have taboos and, and can't be recorded, depending on the community. But there's also all kinds of little rituals, how you open doors or don't open doors. Those, those things are really important to get, to get an understanding of, of how language is used by people.